Um, hi, everyone. My name is Anwar Hijaz. I teach at Saddleback College in Political Science, but I'm also faculty support at CBC and at One. Um, welcome, everyone, to this wonderful webinar titled How to Make Documents Accessible from Your Canvas Course with, with Sean Jordison. Um, I want to get started by introducing our wonderful, wonderful facilitator today. Um, Sean Jordison is an accessibility expert with 13 years experience. His passion lies in enhancing access to information for all and ensuring uh, equality and in information accessibility. Sean's journey in this field is driven by the profound impact accessibility has on people's lives. And he has dedicated his career to breaking down bar barriers and allowing equal information access. Professionally, Sean has engaged in diverse projects, ensuring documents accessibility and conducting numerous trainings on Section 508 accessibility and assistive technology. His experience also includes working with students with disabilities, reviewing online courses, websites, and third-party content for accessibility compliance. Sean's expertise covers captioning, document accessibility, assistive technology, and guiding organizations in adhering to accessibility best practices. We're really looking forward, Sean, to um, hearing your webinar today. Uh, but before we get started, I do want to give a little bit of an announcement also that during the webinar, um, we will be linking a survey um, to get feedback from you all. So we will be dropping this survey um, about within 30 minutes into the survey and then every 15 minutes there on. Um, we really, really appreciate your feedback. The survey um, will help us to improve um, our programming and create more programming that will you know, help us all. So uh, the last thing is that at, at One, although At One offers badges as proof of completion, for our courses, we are not providing badges for attending the webinar. Um, and if your institution does require proof of attendance, we recommend that you submit the, the survey um, since you will get an email back with um, proof of completion. But if you do need further verification, please reach out to us. We will provide the email in the chat um, if you need more information. So with that, I will go ahead and turn it to you, Sean. Awesome. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I feel like I don't know who wrote it, but it sounded amazing. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, really quick, uh, in the chat, I would love for all of you, if you don't mind, uh, let me know where you're from and maybe a little bit about what you do at your college, please. And I definitely recognize some names here in the chat. Uh, but for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Sean Jordison. Uh, and I'm super happy to be here. We have like a ton of content to cover, so much. And I feel like it's my duty to guide this conversation to a place that you all want to take it. I'd rather not spend a lot of time on, do I need to caption my videos or do my images need alt text? But I'm happy to go there if we need to. Um, today's session, we're gonna focus on converting content like from PowerPoint, Word, and PDF into Canvas pages. And I only cover that a little bit because I think the meat of this presentation is going to be in how to make those documents accessible in their native file formats. And awesome. Thank you all for your introductions here. Uh, so my introduction was fantastic. Uh, I'm currently an adjunct faculty member at Santa Monica College where I help uh, faculty members align their courses for CVC OEI. Um, and if you know anything about me, uh, you know I've been in this space for a long time. Uh, alternate media specialists, I can create Braille, MP3 files, more advanced accommodations for math accessibility. Um, so really, I encourage all of you, uh, if you have any questions, to please put them in the chat. Uh, and for my uh, fellow facilitators here, I actually love to be interrupted. So please speak up if there's a question and I would love to direct my attention to it. And with that said, let's get started. All right, let me get these floating boxes situated. Okay, so today, uh, the title of today's webinar is called Making Documents Accessible 
in Canvas. Now, this title kind of fits, but it doesn't quite fit, uh, as we're not going to be going over accessibility tools built into Canvas, which is sort of a different topic. So if you have like the Pope Tech tool or the built-in accessibility checker, we are not going over those tools, just as a heads up. I don't want to waste any more time on the introduction. Hello, my name is Sean. Nice to meet all of you. Uh, and what this session will cover today, um, I'm going to do a brief introduction of Section 508. We are going to talk about some files and accessibility requirements for Word, PowerPoint, and PDF. And then we will also talk about, uh, should you just convert it to a Canvas page? I know there are some people on this call, or if you're running a department, um, Oftentimes, it is much simpler to just get that content into Canvas and use your Canvas accessibility features um, as opposed to learning the ins and outs of like PDF accessibility. But for those of you that want to take it a step further, uh, today's session will give you, uh, it'll want you, it'll leave you wanting more. And then finally, my plan was to cover uh, some demos on how to make a Microsoft Word doc accessible, a PowerPoint file accessible, and an Adobe PDF file accessible. So let's get the boring stuff out of the way. I promise this is the worst part of the presentation. I mean, the best part. Um, so what is Section 508? Well, uh, Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Uh, in 1998, Congress amended the Rehabilitation Act to require federal agencies to make their electronic and information technology accessible to people with disability. Uh, the law applies to all federal agencies when they develop, procure, maintain, or use electronic information technology. Under Section 508, agencies must give disabled employees and members of the public uh, access to information that is comparable to the access available to others. This is why I am in this space, is that sentence, basically. Now, in 2018, uh, Section 508 was amended to include what's called the WCAG or WCAG or Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And then we have a couple of like numbers and letters. Uh, but the important part to understand is that the revised 508 standards incorporate the WCAG 2.0 level AA success criteria. Uh, and they apply to both web and non-web electronic content. Basically, what that means is it also applies to documents and not just web pages. And a lot of the resources that you see out there, they're kind of geared towards websites. And I like to think, you know, my responsibility is to interpret those and learn how to apply them to documents specifically. So that's what we're going to be learning about today. Now, I reference uh, WCAG quite a bit, uh, but I just wanted to point out like it's the this conformance level is used in most accessibility rules and regulations uh, around the world, uh, including the ADA or Americans with Disabilities Act. That's why it's such a big deal. It's used everywhere. Uh, it is sort of a uniform international standard. Now, there are a couple of like notable requirements. This is certainly not an exhaustive list. This is just like some stuff that I feel is important for you all to know. Color contrast. It's a big one. You need to test it. I don't want to see yellow on white. I don't want to see cyan on white. I'm sure you have a wonderful reason as to why you might be using pink in your course. I just want to ensure that it's passing color contrast requirements. And I am going to show you a tool today that's free to download and takes five seconds to test. Additionally, any images, charts, or graphics that you use in any of your content must use alternate text. And we want to make sure that alt text is clear uh, and descriptive and conveys the appropriate meaning. Uh, navigational elements are consistent throughout the site. So that's like a website statement, but what it's trying to say is your users want to expect similar things as they are going through your course. So this is perfect for in Canvas, we want our modules to sort of feel the same. Uh, the layout should be consistent. If you are using images or links or videos, uh, we want to create a similar style throughout the entire course. Um, form fields have accurate labels. I doubt you all are developing forms, but if you are, 
uh, they should have descriptive labels either near the form or, you know, inside of the form. And then again, this is a little more web-based status updates. Um, so if you're working on a website and it updates, that update needs to be conveyed to the people um, through a screen reader. And then finally, uh, you want to make sure you are using headings in a logical order. All right, but what does it all mean? Well, in plain terms, it means federal agencies are required to make their information and communication technology accessible to people with disabilities. It applies to every aspect, uh, the development, procurement, maintenance, and use of information and communication technology. Uh, and agencies must give disabled employees, students, and members of the public access to information that is comparable to the access of others. Um, this image on the right side of my screen uh, has been around a long time, and I just love it. It's kind of blurry. I can't seem to find a crisp one, but I just think it perfectly encapsulates what we are trying to do. Um, on the left side of the image, there are three people who are reaching for some fruit in a tree, and underneath them is the word equality. Uh, these three different height people all have the same box, but only one person is able to reach the fruit. On the right side of this image, we have three different height people, and they have three different height boxes. And underneath them is the word equity. And in this example, each person is able to reach the fruit that they are reaching for. So when we are designing our content for accessibility, we are trying to give everyone the box that they need. That is sort of the point of what we're doing. I don't care about passing accessibility checks. I don't care about green check boxes. Those things don't matter. Um, they are a part of the process, but ultimately, you know, we want everyone to be able to reach their fruit. All right, that was the boring stuff. Um, it's all fun from now on. Okay. I wanted to start off with talking about some best practices, no matter the platform. Uh, this is sort of like across the board, Word, PowerPoint, PDF, HTML, Canvas, Excel, you name it. These are some things you want to try to do. Um, try to avoid using images that contain text. I can't tell you how many times I've reviewed a, a course and there is a giant screenshot of like a computer application or even pages out of a textbook. Um, a screen reader can't read images in that same way. Uh, even with alt text, we have limitations to how many characters we can put. Basically, it's, it's like a no-no. So when you can, try to use live text on a page um, and don't just use images that contain text. Alternate texts should be based on context. We're gonna go over some examples today, but again, this is a conversation I've had a million times. Do we care um, that, you know, the man speaking right now is wearing a blue shirt, right, Sean? Do, do we care? Probably not. Um, do we care that I'm giving a presentation on how to make documents accessible in Canvas? That's much better alternate text than the guy in the blue shirt talking, right? Sometimes we need to use our best judgment um, when writing alternate text. And it's really easy to accidentally like give information when we should have marked it decorative. Uh, I am a proponent of marking a lot of content decorative because a lot of it doesn't add any additional value. With that said, let's keep going. Don't get me started because I can go right off the rails. All right. <laughs> so there are actual fonts that are better than other fonts when you are designing your content. This is going to be more for like the documents, not for Canvas itself. Um, but essentially you wanna to stick to the simple ones, the sans serif fonts. So we have Tahoma, Calibre, Helvetica, Arial, Verdana, Times New Roman. There are others, try to stick to those. I know, I know what you're thinking. Sean, those fonts don't do it, but I'm sorry, uh, you gotta use them. All right, also try to use font size 11 or larger. This is sort of a best practice, not a hard requirement, um, but the smaller you get, the more difficult it can be for not only people with low vision or colorblindness, uh, but if people also have different tech that they're using, it can be challenging to zoom appropriately. So try to go 11 or larger. PowerPoint, I like to go 24. Um, next, you wanna make sure you test your color contrast manually. All of these wonderful accessibility scans, um, scams, sorry, scans, uh, they don't, actually tests for color contrast that well. 
uh, because the computers just aren't uh, smart enough to do it yet. Now, don't get me wrong. Okay, there are exceptions. I like Canvas's accessibility checker for color contrast. Pretty amazing. I love it. But I think it's better to have your own tool in your toolkit uh, so you know what you're checking for. Don't, don't become over-reliant on the accessibility checkers. And the same goes for PowerPoint, Word, uh, and PDF. Tables. I have seen about a million tables where the point was to left and right justify content. Please stop doing that. Tables should be used to display, compare, and contrast data. And more than that, they must have a heading row or column for the data. So when you're using a screen reader and you engage with the table, there is a hotkey you can press uh, that will read either your header for the column or the row and then your data cell. So there is a very distinct purpose as to why it exists. Uh, be careful on relying on color alone for meaning. This is a big one I see in a, a lot of different course reviews where professors are highlighting stuff in yellow or making content uh, like red letters or basically you can't use color as the only means of emphasis. So if you are drawing attention in that way with bolding or italics, you should probably also make it a heading so that people using the screen reader can navigate it appropriately. Screen readers do not read different font colors. They don't read highlighted text. Um, they don't read bold and italics either. They do, however, read strong and emphasize in HTML, but that's a bit outside the scope of this. Just be aware that when you're using bold, screen readers nine out of 10 times aren't gonna pick it up. So we wanna mark content like that a heading. And then finally, just because you know I understand my audience, yes, that video needs to be captioned. Just gonna say it, I'm sorry, it has to. You have to do it. Auto-generated doesn't count. You can do it. It's not that hard. There are a lot of tools out there, a lot of resources to the California Community College system. Um, I mean, every college is building their own cart. I promise you, you can figure this out. Okay. With that said. Sean, I got um, a question directly to me saying, are there, will you share any resources of how to make videos more accessible, more easily than having to go in and retype all the um the captioning um i will put that back on you i believe there are some courses that oei cdc offers um but off the record on the record uh i love to use tools automated tools like otter ai um canvas studio is amazing for hosting videos that uh are not yours and you can upload a caption track uh absolutely fantastic tools out there these days. I do not expect anybody to be retyping. Um, if you've recorded a video, there are automated tools. Some of them might cost a little bit of money, but how much is your time worth? Um, it just depends. I've worked in some courses where we had over a hundred hours of recorded content and the professor, uh, you know, didn't want to spend $10 on a tool that could do it all for him. And that's fine. So we taught him how to do it, downloading the track from YouTube, making the manual edits, uh, you know, and he found that some of the content wasn't relevant. So when you kind of put yourself through that, that struggle of, of closed captioning, um, you may even uh, increase the quality of your, of your course content. It's an interesting thing that happens. Oh, I see another comment uh, for the bolds and marking it as a heading. If it's a long sentence or paragraph, does marking it as a heading make it confusing for students? mistaking it as a title. Um, so Amber, let me um just talk about it for a second. It's not that you can't use bold. You can use bold. However, if it's really important, like due dates, right? In your Canvas page, you have a, a words that says due dates and it's bold. That's not enough. It needs to be a heading. However, if you are bolding some point of emphasis within a paragraph, there's no problem with that so long as there isn't like an activity tied to it, right? Here's what I don't want to see. I don't want to see like, okay, participants, um, who could tell me what the bold text is on this slide, right? That's what you want to avoid. 
Um, however, if you're just bringing a little bit of emphasis and it's not like a hard requirement, it's okay to use. What about color-coded maps? That's a great question. Um, I'm gonna have to table that one uh, just because there's a lot to say about it. Uh, there's a couple of different things you can do. There's an accommoda accommodations for students that are low vision or blind where we can make the maps tactile. There's a lot of different things. There are some low level things that we're gonna talk about today on how to make charts and graphs accessible, which would also apply to maps. Sometimes you may need a uh, detailed alternate text, uh, but when I'm designing accessible charts and graphs, I like to use patterns, colors that pass color contrast, and labels. If we increase the font size, does it count as a heading? That is a great question, Ellis. That is a great question. No, it doesn't. Uh, a heading is a structural element that is applied to the back end coding uh, when you're looking at a text file. Uh, within Microsoft Word, it is called a style. Uh, within PDFs, they are explicitly called headings. Within Canvas, they are also explicitly called headings. And fun fact, there are no headings in PowerPoint, just titles. That is a great question. Though. Awesome. I love it. Keep them coming. Okay, let's uh, move on. We still have a lot of stuff to cover, um, and I tend to talk a lot, but... We're going to get through it. So how does this apply to my documents? I've kind of said it 100 different times. Under Section 508, documents must be accessible, um, and they all have their different criteria. So this is my favorite slide. Um, it's been around forever, and I put it pretty much put it in all of my presentations. Uh, accessibility equals usability. So if you might be thinking, but Sean, a, a person who's blind is never going to take my class. That is beside the point. The more accessible you can make your content, the more usable it becomes for everyone. Sort of like that discussion of fixing the closed captionings. You may find that like half of your video is pointless because you know if you're going to spend all that time editing captions, you better make sure it's important of what you said. Additionally, when we think about things like closed captioning, it not only helps people who are deaf and hard of hearing, uh, but it helps people who are English second language learners. Uh, it helps people who are maybe have a long distance to travel and they're on the bus and they need like, they can't have the sound. Uh, there's a lot of uses for it. Uh, additionally, things like curb cuts in, in sidewalks or elevators, they not only help people with disabilities, uh, they help the general public too. And the same I would say goes for documents uh, in the way you structure your Canvas content. You know, if, if you build a structure into your course shell that is consistent, you will find yourself removing things. You will find yourself adding uh, important content to places where it may be lacking. And I promise you, overall, your course is going to be much stronger and much more succinct. All right. Let's keep going. So styles, headings. Uh, this applies to Word, PDF, and Canvas. So H1 or heading 1 is the most important idea on the page. And this is a specific setting, uh, Ellis, to your question earlier, like you highlight the text and you select the heading one in Word. Or in Canvas, the page title is always your H1. So the first heading that you will pick in Canvas will be your H2. So that will be your most important item on the page. Subsections should begin with an H2. And then we have this rule where don't skip headings from top to bottom. So if you have an H1, the very next one should be an H2. And if you have additional content that fits inside of your H2, it should be an H3. What we don't wanna see is our heading one, and then we skip to a heading four. Because if I'm using assistive technology, uh, I might be looking for that heading two and that heading three content. And so again, it's another way to build consistency throughout your content. Try not to select your heading levels based on appearance. You can change the way they look. Um, again, why I love your question earlier, Ellis, about like, does changing the size do anything? It just doesn't. It's all about the back end structure of it. And if you don't like the way it looks in Canvas or Word, you can change it. Uh, do not use bolding instead of a heading. We've kind of um, talked about that. Uh, think of headings like an outline. And if content doesn't fit inside of your outline, it may not belong on that page or in that course. 
Uh, it also helps provide a visual break between content, thus improving the usability for everyone. And it's actually uh, the number one method that users of assistive technology use to navigate larger documents. All right, I see some chit chat happening. Do we have to follow indent rules for headings also? That's a good question, Ellis. Uh, you do not. So screen readers don't read space unless you put them in there. Like uh, if I fell asleep on my keyboard on the enter key, a screen reader is going to read those. It'll say blank, 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 blank. Um, if you have, if you did a bunch of spaces for like uh, what you should have used as a tab key, right? You want center justification for some text. Don't use that uh, space bar because the screen reader is going to read all those blank spaces. So you want to use your like regular formatting that you would for any design, um, but use it the way that it should be. So tab keys, center justification through your rich content editor, things like that. For Word, uh, does title count as a heading or should it be avoided? Chase, that's a great question. That feels like a plant. Are you a plant, Chase? Just kidding. Um, so I love that question. Here's the thing. Screen readers like can't read the title attribute unless it's in HTML. So if your end file is going to be HTML, you can use the title attribute. Um, if it's in Word, a screen reader does not recognize title as anything other than plain body text. So it is my professional opinion to not use it. That's just my opinion. You can use it, but just understand it is not recognized as a heading and it's not a recognized structure element from within Microsoft Word in terms of its uh, navigational use with assistive tech. Yeah, it's very strange. That's why I was like, are you a plant? Because it's a very specific question. However, if you're going to HTML, go for it. Eduardo says, can you show us where we can find H1 on the Canvas toolbar? Uh, my friend, you cannot set H1s in Canvas. So uh, Canvas, when we think about accessibility, think of all the different platforms as different buckets. They kind of have their own like rules. And in the Canvas bucket, you don't get to set H1s. H1s are your page title always, and you do not have the ability to adjust them. So in Canvas, the first heading you will apply is actually an H2. Perfect. Great questions, guys. All right, hyperlinks. How am I doing on time? All right, plenty of time. So hyperlinks, uh, hyperlinks that include link text that identifies the purpose or destination of the link can provide important clues that help website visitors choose which link to follow. Try to be as descriptive as possible without being overly long. Hold on, I got more. I know there's questions. So on this slide, I have a table with two columns. On the left column, we have not best practice. I just couldn't think of a better phrase to put of things you shouldn't do. So here's what you don't wanna do. Uh, you don't wanna use the full URL of a website. So something like, you know, www.blahblahblah.com, the screen reader is going to read every one of those characters. Um, if there are words in there, it will try to read it. But if you think of longer URLs, like from Google, it just is a nightmare from a screen reader experience. Additionally, try not to use vague language. So today, you know, in 2024, we know that links are clickable. So don't tell me to click it. Uh, Click here is dead. Forget it. Lose it. Don't ever type click here again, please. Um, or more info. So you can use those words, but I don't want to see them on hyperlinks. Now, Envision, you're a screen reader user, and I pull up a hotkey of all the links in my 20-page document. And we've linked click here, that text, over and over and over. All that I'm going to see as a screen reader user is that text click here just repeated over and over and over. It gives me no context as to where I'm going. Um, and it's just against best practice. So if there's anything I could have you take away from this session, it's avoid the use of vague language on your hyperlinks. Additionally, we're still in the left column. We're on the third row now. Um, try to avoid creating links that cover a significant portion of text making it challenging for users to select specific portions. So in this example, I made the whole thing a hyperlink um, just to show what you shouldn't do. 
that's too long. Um, it would be better to choose a few keywords of what I'm trying to convey there and hyperlink that specific text. All right, now let's move over to the right side of my table where I have a column header called is best practice. So these are the things you should do when formatting your hyperlinks across all platforms. Try to be descriptive and meaningful. One example of this would be read Bloom's taxonomy to learn more about writing effective learning objectives. The keyword Bloom's taxonomy is my hyperlink text. It gives us just enough information as a screen reader user. I would know like a little bit about where I'm going. It's not overly long uh, and it looks pretty clean on the page and it's embedded within the sentence. Uh, try to use clear visual cues to differentiate links from regular text, like underlining and using a different color. Uh, this is actually a WCAG uh, requirement. Links need two forms of identification. Usually it's color and underlining. And then try to maintain a consistent formatting style for all of your links throughout all of your docs. So whatever blue you're using, try to use that same blue. Also test it for color contrast because there was a time where um, the default link color in Word failed color contrast. All right, now we're gonna move into alternate text. So in the chat, uh, really quick, like 15 seconds or less, what do you know about alt text? Keep it short and simple. What do you think, uh, what are your views on alternate text? Or how should you, maybe not the definition, but like, how would you write alt text? What are some uh, things you think of? Okay, I'm following. I don't know that I can read this fast, but uh, you all have access to the chat. Uh, needs to explain the context. Needs to explain the content if it holds, if not explained in the text before or after. Yep. Written description, simple description. I use it when the image is important. Ooh, I like that. If someone closed their eyes, how would you describe it? I always use, if I was talking to my dad on the phone, I'm like, hey, dad, this is what I'm looking at. Description of picture. Yeah, you guys got it. All right. Ooh, that's good. Okay. All right, let's keep going. You guys got it. I wasn't sure. Sometimes my audience has no idea what alt text is. Even in 2024, you'd be surprised. But let's go over some not best practices. So I have another table on this slide. Um, these are kind of like, this is easy peasy stuff, right? We kind of know what to do here. Don't use your file extension in the alt text, please. I, I don't want to see it. JPEG, PNG. It's very common when you are designing Word docs and you're inserting images from your computer. Uh, a lot of times the default alt text will come in. Uh, so it's important to just check it. Try not to use picture of or image of in the leading part of the description because it creates, uh, what's the, uh, duplication. So when a screen reader encounters an image, it's going to say image, and then it will immediately read the alt text. And it's just like a poor user experience when they're getting like image, image of, you know, the duplication of the words. Any hooser, try not to use images of text. Always try to use live text where possible. And if you do have to use an image of a text, I'm thinking um, logos or something that's really popular in Canvas courses is like that uh, banner, banner image. Those are okay. Make sure in the alt text though, you are putting the words that are on the image. Uh, and then also, this is a not best practice, describing decorative images. Keep your decorative images decorative. Um, there is some value to bringing, humanizing your course. So if you are sharing pictures of your cat or your kids or whatever, go crazy. Tell me all about it but don't tell me it's a cat because I don't care. But if it's like fluffy and, you know, you raised her and you found her in a, in a forest one night, you, I don't know. You get what I'm trying to say. All right, let's talk about some best practices. So be descriptive. Tell the user what the purpose of the image is in context and use emotion where necessary. So uh, if somebody's angry, happy, or sad, tell me that stuff. Try to keep your alt text short uh, we used to say like less than a tweet, but you know, I don't know. So 150 characters is pretty good. You can put more, but it creates a keyboard trap for screen reader users. So if you were to accidentally text, a, paste a textbook's worth of information 
in the alt text, it could trap the user in there and they have to listen to the whole thing. Um, try to describe all the relevant information while leaving out the pointless information. And then, yeah, again, make sure your images are marked as decorative. Redundancy, that's the word I was looking for. Thank you. All right, let's keep going because I got a lot more. Uh, here's some examples. On the left side of my screen, I have uh, an aerial view of Central Park in New York. Very simple, clear alt text. However, what if uh, what if I wanted to know the types of trees that were there or the type of buildings? Maybe there was um, a specific like construction company that built the tall ones, right? I don't know. If that's the context, tell me that of the alt text. So it's all about context. In the example on the right, I simply have um, some text and my alt text would be all of the words. So I would say, you know, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. And that's the alt text I would provide. Now, again, it's against best practice to use images of text. However, there's just like a handful of words. So it's like, okay. Is there a question? So since I teach a visual art 3D animation, I should use alt text for images pertinent to the curriculum, but mark others as decorative. That's a great question. Um, you are the artist, Deborah. So make your canvas course as beautiful as you want. I would say it's probably more important in your specific subject to provide alternate text. However, you're the judge. So if I'm a student in your class, tell me what I need to know and leave the other stuff out. Great question. Let's keep going. All right, here's a here's a perfect segue for that question. Uh, alternate text is all about the context. So in the chat, I'd like for you all to pick what you think the best alt text is for this image. And I'm going to go ahead and read them out loud uh, while you are making your selection. So the first option will be astronaut Ellen Ochoa. The second option will be as the first Hispanic woman to go to space and later the first Hispanic director of Johnson Space Center, Ellen Ochoa is widely regarded as a role model. Or option three, a female astronaut with an orange jumpsuit sitting in front of an American flag with a helmet. All right, and whoever gets this uh, right wins 1 million internet points. All right, everyone who chose three loses all those points. Come on, guys. Two. All right, so it's subjective. I was just teasing. They're all right. Um, I like two the best because it gives like, the way I look at alt text personally is like, if you're going to write it, make it important. I don't care that there's a female with an orange jump shoot, you know, an astronaut. I don't care about that. Tell me about the lady that I'm looking at, right? That's just my personal opinion. Technically, all three are going to pass your accessibility standards, but think about the message that you're trying to convey to your students. Do you want them to know what she's wearing or do you want to know the impact that she made on her respective field? Again, I'm biased, so let's see if number two is correct, then users reading the page and not the alt text. Miss that info. That's a great point, Sylvia. Um, yeah, if it's really important, it should uh, encapsulate around the image. Like, okay, that's a fair point. So the, the point was, if number two is the best, people who aren't using a screen reader are going to miss that info. That's fair. That is a fair judgment. If that was the case, this is what I would rather see. I'd rather see the number two description like around the image. And then I would put either number one or three is the alt text, right? Keep the alt text brief, but that is a fair point. You got me there. Isn't it fun to think about either way though? That was the point. So good. If I got you thinking, then I did my job. Gabriella said, Pope Tech Accessibility Checker will flag alt text that is too long. Yeah, you're totally right. That's the other problem with alt text, 150 characters less, keep it brief. Um, and the one that I wrote, number two, probably would get flagged. So you're not wrong. But it's also, it's not like a hard fail, just so you know. All right, what about charts and graphs? Um, I kept this in here because it is always a hot topic. So here's what the requirements are, and then we can all debate about it if you would like after. Uh, this is what is required. Your charts need to have labels. Quit trying to hide your data. 
Okay. I don't need to play a guessing game of like how good my eyes are to find out where a bar ends on a number, right? Just give me the number, please, please. Um, ensure that patterns are used and that they pass color contrast requirements. So patterns are great for if we're printing on a, a grayscale printer or if I have uh, color vision problems. I think I've been talking too much, so my words are jumbled in my brain. Um, be careful of relying on color and meaning alone. So this would be example, like if I had solid colors and I'm just referencing from my legend, like the red, that's going to be a failure on color and meaning because we don't have the pattern. And if I couldn't see red, then that's even further a problem. Uh, if possible, this is the best practice, include the data table that you use to create the chart. And then you could just mark it decorative. Um, and then finally, add alt text to the chart. I know there's a couple questions, but let me finish this train of thought here. Um, so this is the alt text that I would write for this alternate media chart of 2022. Um, it's a bit long. In my head, this was like in Microsoft Word where you're not going to get flagged. In Canvas, I would probably put this on the page and then mark the image decorative. But essentially, this is what it says. I give all the data points. Okay, there's no secrets here. If I have a chart, I'm not trying to withhold information. This graph represents data from alternate media in 2022. In the fall, 24 students were served with a total of 48 book requests. Yada, yada, yada. You get it. I'm giving all the, all the specific data points that I might need that are going to show up on my test. But we can't rely on vision alone when we are creating our course concepts. All right, let's see the questions. Could you use all three? Oh, Angie, I talked way too fast. I don't know what you're referencing with all three. I see number three all the time, so we don't have to do that. I'm assuming you guys are talking about alt text because I went quick. Yes, John, um, I think they are. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Sorry about that. Um, Bethany, I, I hate number three. Let's go back. I, I just, I don't know why it bothers me, but I just feel like it's pointless information. That's how I feel about it. If we were talking about like the designer of the astronaut's jacket, you know, and how they were pivotal and the material and, you know, how it doesn't combust in space, like, sure, tell me about the jacket. But like, as it stands alone, I don't love number three. <laughs> <laughs> Amber, that got me. All right. Yeah, you could use all, all of these descriptions, though. <laughs> all I right, like I'm moving on. Mentioned, um, real quick, I just want to add, I like how you mentioned that it's subjective, because I would want the description. I want, like, personally, so each person is different. Like, I mm -hmm. want to know that the picture, what it's describing, like me, but that's something you don't care about. So we just have to make the best judgment. That's what I'm learning from you, right? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. That's why the... I think it was Deborah asked about the visual arts class, right? Like it's kind of your decision. Like what do you want your students to get from it? If it's important, you know, that they know this or that, then so be it, put it in there. Um, but just don't get stuck on like describing everything because you feel like you have to. It is okay to mark images decorative, like use it. Just remember that too. I think there was like a big push to give all images, alt text, kind of like captioning all videos. And like, it's very important, but sometimes it's okay to use decorative too. All right, did I go too far? Color contrast. Oh my gosh, we still got a lot of stuff to cover, guys. Should I start talking fast? Just kidding. All right, how to test for color contrast. So there's a lot of free tools out there. This one's my personal favorite. It's called the CCA uh, Tool Color Contrast Analyzer from TPGI. Um, we're gonna test it out in a little bit on some sample documents but it's my favorite, super great. They have this like little slider where you can, um, let's say we had uh, a blue and we wanted to use like a blue, but it's failing. They have this slider where you can adjust it and it will tell you if it's passing color contrast requirements and then you can use that blue. Um, I need to throw this link in the chat real quick though. This is a link to uh, that software. All right, no skipping ahead. I saw some of you peeking. All right, color and meaning. This is another hot topic, if you can believe it. So uh, in this table of school assignments, the only indication that an assignment is missing or late is background color. This is inaccessible to someone who is blind, and it may be confusing or inaccessible to someone who is colorblind, 
uh, or overrides page colors. This fails WCAG uh, criteria 1.4.3. Um, so in the image on my screen on the right side of the slide, we have a list of assignments and they just have like random names. What I did this summer vacation, my favorite movie, my favorite animal. One of the elements is highlighted in like this reddish pink um, and one of them is in yellow. But again, the screen reader doesn't read that. So how would you fix something like this? Because right now we are relying on color alone. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it away. Here's the cookies out of the oven. You add another uh, column to fix. So uh, this is what I would do. You can still use color, but now we added a status column. So not only do we have color to bring that additional emphasis, we now have a table header specifically that will tell us the status of that individual assignment. So this is an example where you can use color and meaning and then also make it accessible. Thank you for putting, I don't know what happened to the link in there. Thank you. All right. I really wanted to um, put a lot of effort into tables, but sometimes it can just be a lot. So I tried to keep it simple. This is what you should do for tables. Um, don't use merge cells. Do not use blank cells. Use table headings and keep them really simple. Those are the rules of tables. Okay. That's it. <laughs> We're going to have some examples to cover in demos in a little bit, but um, the big ones are the merge cells. It's just like really hard to make them accessible. If you have nested tables that convey like geographical data, right? And you're breaking down by race and ethnicity, you know, break that data out. Uh, it can just be very challenging if you have too much in there um, for a screen reader user. Do we have a question? The less you alter a table, the better. Um, we can talk about it more, Kelly, when we get into the demos, but sort of. The, the message I'm trying to convey here is keep them simple. So think, you know, three columns, three rows, every cell is filled in. There's no merging, you know, there's no funny business. There's not subheadings within your data. Um, that's like usually the, the culprit is a subheading, uh, you know, with merge cells across. Usually it's better to be two tables in that type of example. But we also will have some examples. All right. So what about converting to a Canvas page? Um, so all the stuff I'm talking about, I could literally go for like eight hours. And we're cramming a lot here in an hour and a half. I have till 1230, right? Just double checking. Okay, perfect. So let's keep flying. In many instances, it's way faster and easier to convert your content into a Canvas page. Um, here's a potential workflow you can use. Uh, save as a text version of your file. So if you're working in PowerPoint, PDF, you can save as a text-based version of your file. You could then copy and paste it into a new Canvas page. Um, and then think of your page as a document moving forward. This is extremely useful if you work in a situation where uh, you are duplicating your course content. Uh, it's just nice to kind of have everything as a Canvas page. And then more than that, I think that making a Canvas page accessible is like the easiest arc to accessibility um, when considering all the other tools that exist. So I have a couple of screenshots here, but we're gonna kind of demo it. Um, in Adobe Acrobat Pro, if you have PDFs, they've really added a lot of uh, juice behind conversion in PDF lately. Now, my PDF, I use the most up-to-date version. It might look different than what you're used to. There was a recent UI upgrade and everything is like flip-flopped. Um, with that said, this is how you would create a Microsoft Word document from your PDF. You simply go to the file button and then you select the option, export a PDF. And in the drop-down menu, we have the ability to choose Microsoft Word. That's one method to getting a text-based file of your PDF. Now, if your PDF was like a picture, right, on your phone that you took of your textbook chapter, if anyone's alarms are going off, yep, I know, don't do it, don't do it. Uh, once you have the text version of your file, simply begin copy and pasting it into a Canvas page. It's really simple. Um, don't overthink it. 
If it's an article, simply provide the MLA or APA reference at the bottom or the top of the page. This is just a best practice that I like to do. So we're not like stealing content. Um, though I will say uh, accessibility law trumps copyright law in every legal standing that has existed. So, you know, we're not reselling content here. If a publisher is producing inaccessible content and you text, get the text and put it in your canvas shell and then give credit, that's okay. You can do that. Um, and then I also, my favorite bullet, like, yeah, you can also do that PowerPoint that you have in your head. I know it's complex, but you can do it. So let's do like a little demo. Um, you should know I'm going completely off the cusp here. So let's go for it. I have a little sandbox. And let's see, I've got a blank page that I'm going to open up. Oh, I knew it. I'm sorry. Give me one moment to re-sign in. I signed in before the training, but um, now would be a good time to ask me uh, any questions if you got them. All right. My apologies. Coming right back. There we go. All right. We've got a blank Canvas page. Okay. I'm ready to build my uh, accessibility best practices course, but wait, we probably have some documents that we need to do first. Hmm, which one should I do? Um, let's take volcanoes. So I have this beautiful looking document that we're going to make accessible in a little while, but it's already text-based. So instead of like stressing about making this Word doc accessible, what if I just went like control A, control C, Control A is select everything. And then Control C is copy. Uh, and then I go to my Canvas page and I paste. Uh-oh, our images are gone. That's okay. There's sort of um some things you can do to quickly get your images in. Uh, but it's sort of like you have to use their little menu here. So what you would have to do is save your page, your, your images out. Um, and because I'm here and we got a little time, this is what I would do. So I'm going to open up that Word document. We can either, um, let's see, what can we do? The reality is this is what I would do. I have this tool called Snippet on my computer. Uh, it's built into Windows. I love this tool. It is fantastic for taking pictures. So I'm just going to use a new snip and I'm going to take a little screenshot of my picture. And then I'm going to save it to my desktop. Real quick, go back to my Canvas page. And then under Pillow Lava, I'm going to go to Insert, Image, Upload Image. And then we are going to find that image. I put it on my desktop, Insert to Canvas. And then here is our alt text. Uh, so I know what this alt text is because this is like a document I've used for like 15 years. Um, it's Pillow Lava. So I'm just going to give it pillow lava. And that is my alt text. And then I'm going to select submit. And there we go. We let's save this page. You're not able just to copy and paste. I'm sorry, one more time, Maria. Uh, you're not able to just copy and paste some um, the word document. Yeah. So I yeah. opened with copy and pasting, but sometimes the image didn't, yeah, like, they don't come in. Just like the image from uh, control C. Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't hear you very well. If you want to put your uh, question in the chat, I would be happy to uh, take a more dedicated look. So okay. sometimes copy and pasting works. Uh, sometimes it doesn't. But in this case, it didn't. Or at least when I, like, did a select all, it didn't work. It might work if we did an individual copy and paste into Canvas. It just sort of, like, depends on, on the content. So now, now that we have this in here, we could start to make the Canvas page accessible. And again, I think making Canvas content is way easier to make accessible than anything else. And so we would we would start. Our page title is our H1. Uh, it's not relevant to the subject, but it's more factual. Uh, Geology 2.3. This is going to be our heading level two. And then our types of lava and magma. This is going to be a heading level three. And then pillow lava, 
Let's go crazy. Let's make it an H4. We then have our image on the screen. My apologies, I have a lot of floating boxes. And then we have our content. So we have some text. We have an inaccessible hyperlink. Uh-oh. Anybody know how we fix this? <laughs> I don't want to spend too much time making a Canvas page accessible. However, uh, what I'm going to do is simply cut the hyperlink. And I would instead paste it on some more important text, like eruptions underwater or ice produce pillow lava. Or I'll just say produce pillow lava. We can go to insert. We can go to link, external, and paste. And that's how you would fix the hyperlink. And then we would just make the rest of this uh, document accessible, maybe delete out the extra spaces. We have our tables in here. There are specific table accessibility requirements for Canvas. But again, I don't want to spend too much time making a Canvas page accessible as that is not the point of this presentation. However, let's just pretend like, boom, it's accessible now, right? We've got all our stuff in there. And now you don't have to worry about the Word doc. Now you can just link to your Canvas page that you made accessible uh, and it kind of lives in your course forever and it's now a part of your course content. It can really help um, you know, reduce the amount of traffic needed uh, in terms of your files back and forth. So in all of my hundreds of course reviews for the CBC OBI, and I mean literal hundreds, I would say the, the biggest failure that I've seen is the use of files. So I know how important this subject is. Please, if you can, convert your stuff to a Canvas page. It is going to save you hours and hours and hours of time. With that said, let's take a look at one more example. Oh, let me check the chat. All right, some people are going to teach me some stuff. I like it. How to convert an entire textbook from PDF to an accessible format. Oh, Lay, that's a whole nother discussion, but I'm happy to help. What is involved in that since there are chapters, sections, et cetera? Um, really, I'm going to answer that quickly because I believe in answering all questions. So uh, this is what I would do, Lay. I use a tool called Abby Fine Reader. It's a professional OCR program. And what it allows you to do is OCR a whole bunch of pages. Let's take a thousand page nursing textbook. And it will allow you to export to Word. From there, uh, you can use different tools like beforehand to organize and extract your pages out. So I skipped a step, my apologies. So if I got a PDF that was a thousand pages, I would literally use the organize pages button in Adobe Acrobat and strip them out. Chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. I believe that there is an alternate media course from the CVC OEI, or it might be through the CCC Accessibility Center where you can learn how to break out chapters like that. Um, and I helped design a little bit of it. So it's good stuff, but that's how you would do it. Uh, you would break it out into chapters or sections. You have to make your executive decision on that. Rona said, I provide notes in the form of my PowerPoints for students. Chapters are anywhere from 35 to 55 pages. That's too many pages for Canvas. I do post links for students or read or download the notes. Is this okay? Rona, you're not, you're not incorrect. I get it. I don't love converting PowerPoints to Canvas. I just was more making the point that you can. Now, in your head, you're thinking 35 to 55 slides. How many Canvas pages is that? because there's not a one for one, right? But I get it. I'm not trying to like say you have to, but what it's gonna make you do is rethink the way you're purposing your content. That's how I would say, but but I'm with you and I can see you in my little box too. So that makes sense, right? Now, if you are absolutely, here, here's the downside to keeping it in PowerPoint. You're gonna have to learn how to make your PowerPoints accessible. That's the downside. And while I don't find it complicated, it can be complicated for those that are kind of new to making their documents accessible. And that's sort of like why I'm pushing it. It is not a requirement to convert them over. It's just a little easier from like that one specific accessibility lens. But great question. Deborah asked, be careful with taking screenshots of pictures over saving them natively. If you see blurry images, yeah, totally. point. Um, Alice said, I've been using Canvas pages to share old articles from my discipline that I think are important. My only other option was scanning these documents, but they were totally inaccessible. Agreed. I have type in the text, but the time 
seems to be worth it. I know this not be the, yeah, Alice, I'm with you. Do what you got to do. Um, I would encourage you to test out the scan in OCR feature built into Adobe Acrobat Pro in their latest version. It's come a long way. And if you have like a ton of content, you might even consider buying one of those professional OCR programs for a brief amount of time. Additionally, and I don't want to speak out of a service that may or may not be offered. Um, there was a tool that was widely supported from our little uh, world here called Census Access, where you could get uh, OCR, basically image-based documents to text. So there might be a similar service at your specific college, um, or you can check in uh, with the team here to see if there's any resources like that available. I just, I'm like one degree removed, so I'm not sure what exactly is available. Maria said, select the picture in Word, copy. Yeah, I could try that again, Maria. Um, see, I did like control A, control C, and it didn't go, but maybe an individual picture would work one at a time. Okay, perfect. I got through all the questions. This is great, guys. All right, we still got a lot to cover, so let's um keep moving. Um, I wanted to show you just briefly, I have an old module, uh, excuse me, it was a PowerPoint file that I converted into a module and it was an introduction to paddleboarding PowerPoint. And I just wanted to show like what you could do. So I made this an individual module, but it used to be a seven slide slide deck, not 35 to 50 like Rona was suggesting earlier. Um, but it's pretty straightforward. We talk about like in this week, we'll do this. Um, we've all seen Canvas course. I mean, it's just very straightforward. There's a quiz. The point I'm trying to make with this is that it was a PowerPoint and we put in the image, we put in the text and I made it a module so that it was, it's like easier to use in different content, right? You can link the individual pages or you could just link to the module itself if it was like some more beefy content, if that makes sense. And then also with a Canvas page, there's not like a hard limit on scroll. So just to our point earlier about the longer PowerPoint presentations, you could probably put three to five slides on a single Canvas page. With that said, um, I wanted to show you something else, but I don't have it. Um, all right. I wanted to show you how to convert the PDF to a Word doc, um, but I don't have a PDF in my sample. So we're gonna jump around a little bit, okay? Bear with me. Next, I'm gonna make this Word document accessible and we're gonna do like the fastest Word doc accessibility you've ever seen in your life. Are you ready? I'm just kidding, um, but not really. So I'm gonna take a top-down approach and just bear with me as I sort of go through this. Actually, I skipped something, hang on. There's one more thing, sorry, I'm a little jumbled today. I wanted to briefly introduce 508 requirements for Word docs. Now I know I've beat the horse here like a million times, but just real quick. So your file name should be descriptive. Th this is if you have Word docs in your Canvas course, this is what needs to happen. Your file name should be descriptive. You want to set the metadata, which is in the advanced properties section, things like the title, subject, and keywords for your document. You want to ensure that you are using heading styles throughout. Ensure that if you use any lists, that they are set from the rich content editor. Your links should be descriptive. Tables should use appropriate headers for columns and rows, alternate text, charts and graphs, review color contrast. Okay, makes sense. All right, now we're going to do the speed run. I like to start at the top of my document um, and work my way down. Just because I've been doing this so long, it works for me. You may find that this is going to work for you in a different way. You might want to apply headings first or make sure your images have alt text first. That's fine. I'm going to go top to bottom and I'm going to try my best to describe it as I go. I am on Windows. I like to press Control F on my keyboard to pull up what's called the navigation menu. This allows me to see all of the headings in my document or my styles. Right now, there are none. Uh, and so what we can do is start applying them. Geology 2.3 volcanoes needs to be a heading one. It is the most important topic on my page. A couple different ways I can do this. From my home ribbon under the styles tab, I can select the heading one option. Or I could do control alt plus one on my keyboard. Types of lava and magma should be a heading level two. I'm going to do the fancy trick, control plus alt plus the number two. 
It's a little shortcut. Or I could have simply selected it from my styles menu. Let's take Pillow Lava, make it a heading level three. Let's validate the alt text on my image. I'm going to select it, right click, choose view alt text. And in here it says pillows. That's not good alt text. I'm gonna say Pillow Lava, but this also, this document, would be an example where I could mark it as decorative simply because my surrounding text has so much like juicy content that I don't have to do alt text here, but I'm going to. So pillow lava, and then we just move on. Uh, there's no like save or close the window. You kind of just move on to the next thing. We have a live hyperlink here. That is the full URL, which is a big no-no. So I'm going to select that link, cut it, delete this like extra text here. Uh, and we did this on the canvas page. I'm just going to take pillow lava and then uh, insert. There's a million different ways to do this. Insert link. And then in the address in the bottom, I'm going to paste that hyperlink. So I, I cut it and then I paste it. And now we have live hyperlink. Let's keep going. Pahoe hoey lava. This is going to be a heading level three, which I use my shortcut on my keyboard, control alt plus three. Let's give it. I am running out of time. Mark is decorative. Ah, lava, heading level three. Mark is decorative. Look at this one. It has AA underscore 90. Psh, that is not good alt text. All right. And then we got another hyperlink in here. This is just my method that I like to use. I like to select the link. Um, try not to like overthink it too much, right? Control X. It's now in my imaginary clipboard. And this thing is heavy. I need to figure out where I'm going to put it down. Um, Let's take it on all lava and then let's set this clipboard down. We're going to right click link paste in the address bar. Okay. Now we have a table. Uh Oh, I'm scared. A uh, table of lava types does need to be a heading. Let's make it a heading level two. And Microsoft word has it's, it's its own bucket, right, of accessibility criteria. This is how you make a table accessible in Microsoft Word. I'm first going to move, move my cursor inside of the table. This will give me two options at the top of my uh, menu bar called Table Design and Layout. These are only available if my cursor is inside the table. See, watch what happens. I'm going to click my header. Whoops, they're gone. Can't make my table accessible now. You have to click inside your table. OK, Table Design. And in the far left side, we have table style options. Now we have header row, first column, and a couple of other options. But those are the two I want you to, to learn. So a header row is the very top. It's the whole row. First column will be everything, all lava, pahoe hoey lava, pillow, et cetera. And then banded rows is simply it will apply an alternating color on your rows. That's all it is. All right. So let's recap. We got header row selected and first column. And for this table, it makes sense. But for me personally, I can't like visually tell that anything has happened. And that bothers me. So in Word, we have the ability to apply a style, a table style. And I love this feature because I'm highly visual in the work that I do. Um, when I select this basic style, it now made my header text darker. So this is an example of a formatting element that is like also accessible. So instead of making this text bold, I used a formatting feature, which tells me all of this content is a heading already. Okay. That's basically it. Um, there's a couple other things we could do, like right click the table and insert our table properties. Um, we can choose allow row to break across pages. This is a little more advanced accessibility. So if you are creating budget reports or things like that, uh, please reach out and I can give you some additional information on a little more complex tables. All right, difference between magma and lava. This seems like it should be a heading level two in my opinion. We've got another table. This one, in my opinion, should just be header row and not first column. So this data here doesn't need to be like a header. I'm still going to apply a style, which makes the top row bold, which is what I want. And my rows look good. Um, let's move on. Lava review, heading level two. And then there's actually a trick built in here, but because I like you all, I'm going to just give away the secret. This is a supposed to be a bolted list. So if you didn't see it, now you know. 
Um, I'm going to select the four elements and then select bulleted list for my rich content editor. And let's zoom out a little bit. And we got a good looking doc. Let's, uh, let's run the accessibility checker, which if you notice, I don't mention it all in my presentation. It's because I hate it. Um, I try not to rely on it because if you have strong fundamentals in your accessibility practice, you will not need it the same way. I like to use it as a final verification of the work I've already done. So uh, this is an accessible Word doc. Pretty cool, huh? All right, I flew through that. Uh, let's keep going. Hmm, what do I wanna do here? Let's, what do you guys wanna see next? PowerPoint or PDF? I think you're gonna say PDF, so I should show you PowerPoint. Let's see, do we get a vote? PDF, I knew it, I knew it. You guys think you're slick. All right, sorry, PowerPoint first, but I'll be brief, promise. I, what, hold on. All right, so there's some 508 rules for PowerPoint. Okay, just cause I know PDF is the most popular, that's why I'm saving it for last. So here's what you need to do for making your PowerPoints accessible. Um, your file name needs to be descriptive, set your metadata. I didn't show you how to do that in Word, but it's the same idea. You go to File, Info, Properties, Advanced Properties, and this is where you're going to fill in your title, subject, author, uh, category, keywords, things like that. Uh, slide titles. So this is unique to PowerPoint. Slide titles need to be unique. Um, lists, links, and tables are all formatted properly. We've kind of talked about that. Alternate text, color contrast, we get it. Uh, reading order. So in PowerPoint, you have to set your reading order of the elements that are appear on each slide um, and only use elements from the master theme. Do not insert text boxes because they will not be read by a screen reader. I know it's wild, right? Okay, I have a sample of PowerPoint. This is actually like a rough draft of my presentation that I was creating. Um, with that, we are going to make it accessible real quick. So. Earlier, I mentioned I don't love the accessibility checker, but I do for PowerPoint. I have a confession. I just do. So I'm going to do file, info, check for issues, check accessibility. And because I'm running out of time, I'm flying through this a little bit. So my apologies if this is like, you're talking too fast. I get it. Um, check it out. There's not that many problems in here. So in here, we have a picture that is missing alternate text. It sure is. This is that uh, export to Word, I'm going to right-click it, view alt text, and we're gonna add some alt text in here. And I'm going to say uh, a screenshot from Adobe Acrobat Pro, which highlights the ability to export a PDF to MS Word by selecting a file, export a PDF, MS Word. Boom. Then we go back to the accessibility checker and oh, they try to get funny and add some auto-generated description. Uh-oh, let's see what it's going to tell me that I am. It's a robot with 25 arms, a person in a suit. At least they didn't call me bald. Just kidding. Uh, Sean Jordison, the best presenter of all time. Just kidding. All right, that's it for that. And then, uh, yeah, so this... PowerPoint's actually pretty good. Um, I feel like it's kind of lackluster in making it accessible, but that's because the OEI CBC puts some time in developing a strong accessible template. So kudos to you guys. Here's another low level check I would do though. So pretend I didn't view that, the accessibility thing. Um, how else would I would check this? I would go to view and then I would go to outline view. And what I wanna see in here is what I see, a bunch of text. We have our titles, which are very clear, um, and easy to uh, see in my outline view. We then have text, which is in here. We have introduction, Sean. Um, basically, it has everything in there. Now, why is this important, Sean? Well, if we were taking this file to any other file type, it really depends a lot on this information. Um, and... If the content wasn't in here, let me show you a way to mess this up really quick. And then I promise I'll get to PDF. So let's just say I'm on my Sean Jordison introduction slide and I go to insert 
Um, get out of here. And we do text box. And I'm just going to slap something in here. Like, I don't know. Hello, world. And let's just pretend this is like really, really important. And it's on the exam later. So I hope you're all paying attention. Um, if you notice, nothing happens in my introduction slide. So it's not here. So this is like indicative that it will not appear to a screen reader. So if you are designing content in PowerPoint, the best advice I can give you is stick to your theme. That means when you are creating content, um, use the built-in themes as this will ensure that your content will be read by a screen reader. And more than that, it will control the reading order of the content on this slide. So when you start inserting objects, you not only mess with the screen reader capabilities of reading the content, but also the reading order itself. All right, I wanna spend some time on PDF. So <laughs> they're the worst, so I wanna see your magic. All right, all right, all right. You asked if notes were included. Yeah, really quick. Um, No, so the notes section is like, it's like a free for all. Some screen readers can get into it. Some have difficulty. Um, I, it kind of sucks. So if you have content that you really want your users to know, I personally would not put it only in the notes section. I would put it on the slides, but that is just my like personal opinion. The way that a screen reader user accesses that content is really clunky. So if you have a lot of notes sections, make sure you are like calling it out, right? Let's say I have this PowerPoint linked in my Canvas shell, call out like check the notes section because it's kind of a hidden feature and you have to like explicitly go to it. There's no heading that says notes. All right, let's go to PDF. Um, really quick, back to my main slide. So what's required for PDF accessibility? Oh my gosh, I knew this was a lot to cram in, but wow. All right, same rules, file name, descriptive, set your metadata. Documents need to be tagged, okay? We need our headings, lists, links, figures, artifacts, tables. They must have an appropriate tag structure. Again, I can do a full training four hours on PDF accessibility alone, so bear with me. Um, tables need to have headers just like every other program. Alt text, color contrast. Reading order is controlled by the tags panel. Um, if you use form fields, they need to have what's called tool tips, which is the hover action. So if you hover your mouse over a form field, it will tell you what needs to be put in there. And then if your document is more than nine pages under section 508, it needs to have bookmarks. All right, let's create a PDF. Uh, I'm gonna take this PowerPoint that I have um, and I'm gonna select, th there's two ways you can create a, a, pow a bleh, PDF. I'm gonna show you the wrong way. So I have my accessible Word doc. Here's the wrong way to create a PDF. I'm gonna do control P or not, and I'm gonna create Adobe PDF. This is the wrong way, okay, for the recording. Don't do this, people. I'm gonna say no good, okay? That's the bad way, and I'm gonna show you why. Uh, the first thing that we'll notice, so I have my document open, and I'm gonna open up my tags panel, which is on the right side in this new Adobe Acrobat. Looky there, no tags available. We have a fully accessible Word doc, that I printed to PDF, stripped everything. Not good. Okay, no tags here. This is not accessible. You get it. Here's the accessible way to do it. I'm going to select my Acrobat toolbar tab, and I'm going to create PDF. We're going to save this file. And then this one will be correct. Well, it will have tags. So let's open up the tags panel of this file. And looky there. We have, I can't zoom in on this window, my apologies. On the far right side, we have a list of tags. Um, I have this option selected that will highlight the content as I move through the tags panel. A requirement that not a lot of people talk about is the use of what's called a document tag. So our document tag is our main parent tag, and it has a whole bunch of children. We also have some section tags or part tags. These have no bearing on accessibility, and they are simply used to chunk content for remediators or people reviewing content in the tags panel. With that said, I like to do this technique that's called walking the tags tree. So the first thing I do to check accessibility of my PDFs, 
open up the text panel and I'm using the down arrow on my keyboard and I'm just gonna walk through this content. So we have our H1, H2, H3, P tag, and it's this little space on the bottom right of uh, this image. Like get the heck out of here. So how do we get it out? Um, your instinct is gonna be to hit the delete key. That's wrong. This is the real way that you do it. Um, and you just kind of have to take it at face value because I only have nine minutes. So I'm gonna right click this empty container tag and I'm going to change tag to artifact. And then artifact type, we will select page, page nation, pa pagination, it doesn't matter. That will properly remove the content from your tags panel. Now, if I were to hit the delete key and I run it through accessibility checks, uh, the screen reader actually will still pick it up. So you have to do it that very specific method, um, which is also why I encourage anyone who's making PDF documents accessible, forget the accessibility checker, go download the PAC 2024 tool and test for PDF UA compliance. Okay, I'm rambling. Let's keep going. We've got a figure tag. Let's just check the alt text. I'm going to right click the figure tag and select what am I doing? Alt text, properties. So right click properties. And then we have this option, alternate text for images, pillow, lava. Maria asks, can we rename the accessibility tags? What do you want to name it? Um, You know, to honor your question, I think I know where you're going. I'm just being a goofball, um, but I don't have any time to be a goofball. So what I would do is like finish walking through this and any blank tags, I would artifact them. Um, but let's just pretend, let's go back to our other one, our no good, our no bueno volcanoes document with no tags. Um, how would you tag this document? A couple different methods. You could use the auto tagger, which will attempt to apply a structure by itself. Or you can go old school, which is like my preferred method of tagging, where we can open up our accessibility panel and we can use what's called the reading order tool to begin tagging. So um, whew, I'm jumping around here. My apologies if this is confusing. So I have an untagged document. I have what's called the reading order tool open. And now I'm going to drag some boxes around my content and I'm going to forcefully tag it like manually by myself. So I'm gonna select geology 2.3. This is gonna be a heading level one. And it will place it in the tags panel on the right-hand side. So we now have our parent H1 tag followed by our child container element, which is the actual live text. Then we go through and do the same thing. And let's say like, whoops, I slipped and hit H6. That's a that's an accessibility no-no. We can't skip from an H1 to an H6. That's bad best practice. So to answer your question finally, Maria, can we change this tag? Yes. But you have to play within the parameters that Adobe Acrobat allows us, which is going to be, um, it has to be like an H and a number. So this is how I would do it. There's a couple different ways. We can change the tag by right clicking it, going to properties, and then using the drop down menu to select the correct tag. In this case, it'll be heading level two, or we can press F2 on the keyboard and we can get our cursor in here to update stuff. I could change it back to an H6. But to your point, you can actually go outside the brackets here and you can give it text. Uh, and it's called a title attribute. And this is actually a method that is used sometimes when converting large textbooks um, because there's so much content. There's no page breaks in the accessibility tags. So if you have a thousand page textbooks, it's just like an infinite scroll. However, you can put these title tags in there and like visually it'll pop a little bit more. All right, since I only have like a minute uh, or two, I want to briefly walk you through the method that I personally use to, ta to tag a PDF. This is what I use, okay? And I am using the most up-to-date version of Adobe Acrobat Pro. And there's some caveats. This document didn't come out of Canva. It didn't come out of Google. This is a document that came out of Word, okay? I like to open up my prepare for accessibility options from the tools menu, and I'm going to select automatically tag a PDF. Now I have to be honest with you, I'm using the latest version of Adobe Acrobat Pro DC. They have added AI. That's like a real thing now in all of these platforms. If you are not using the newest version, it will not look as clean as you're gonna see on my screen. From here, so the number one step, get a tag structure in there. 
Second step, validate the tag structure. And I'm going to do that by that method I say of walking the tags panel. Section tags are okay. They have no bearing on accessibility. Um, we're just going to walk through it. We've got H3 figure tag. It's beautiful. Our P tag has, uh, well, our hyperlink didn't come through, but that's because we did the print. So we would need to add that in. But H2 figure paragraph, H2 figure paragraph, H2 table, and we have table rows that contain our table headers. It's absolutely phenomenal. Now it could be the auto tagger is picking up that I picked it up from Word and it's applying some magic that might not actually be there. Um, like if we had a scanned doc, I don't think it would work this well. But essentially we have the tag structure. Now the next thing I would do is run the accessibility checker. Um, we go check for accessibility in the far left panel, start checking. And then there's probably a few things we need to fix. Uh, figure tags need alt text. Our tables are missing summaries. Um, but with that, I am out of time, my friends. That was a whirlwind. I know. You did great. Please uh, reach out if you would like some additional resources, and I can try to help with that. And where it's all yours. Thank you so much, Sean, for such a wonderful um, presentation. I, I definitely learned a lot and made a lot of notes of things I need to go into my courses and make some updates. Um, and thank you everyone for attending um, and giving uh, Sean attention. Once again, please look um, to the chat for the survey link. Um, Sochi, if you don't mind just dropping it in one more time. Uh, the survey is set up to allow you to receive a copy of your responses which can serve as a verification for your attendance. And if you experience any issues, please reach out to support at cvc.edu. Um, we hope that you register for other webinars that we'll be offering throughout the term. We'll drop a link in the chat um, that can showcase some of the upcoming webinars that we have. Um, and then lastly, uh, this webinar will be available on our website. Just give us some time to make sure that it is accessible when we post it. So thank you all so, so much, and I hope you all have a wonderful day.